So this session is called Enabling Infrastructure. It's really referring to the critical supporting technology, test beds and networks that will be necessary for the realization of space resource utilization. We'll cover technologies and infrastructure that support both ground-based research and in situ resource utilization. This session is chaired by Beth Lomax. Again, you will recognize her year on year here at Space Resources Week. She's a research fellow with ESA based at STEC in the Netherlands. She supports ESA's ISRU related activities and her research focuses on the extraction of oxygen and metals from lunar regolith. Enjoy the session. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session. We've got some really interesting talks coming up. Uh, so our first talk is online, and it's uh, Connor Gaiman from OrbitFab, and he'll be talking about building the lunar storable propellant si supply chain. Thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, uh, I wish I could have been there in person, but uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be joining you online. The sun is uh, just rising here in uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, but today I just want to spend a few minutes talking to you guys about um, building the lunar storable propellant supply chain because I think uh, storables are something that is going to be a really critical piece of infrastructure on the moon and beyond in the very near future. And it's something that's really not being talked about enough. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, a little bit about Orbit Fab. Um, a little bit about me first. Uh, I'm a systems engineer at OrbitFab. Um, I lead our, our new technology development efforts at OrbitFab. So that involves um, R&D projects and things that are um, kind of on the, on the cutting edge. So lunar storable propellants are a good example of that. Um, OrbitFab just turned five a couple months ago. Um, we're based out of Colorado. And um, we've flown to space a couple times and have gotten investment from a number of a number of great investors, including Lockheed and Northrop. Um, so we're really excited with the progress that we're making towards on orbit refueling. Um, our fueling port, Rafti, is, is baselined on a number of government and commercial satellites. Um, and we've already signed an in space fuel deal with Astroscale um, early last year to deliver them uh, propellant by the end of this decade or so. Um, and then we've also got another Department of Defense refueling mission in 2025. Next. So this is, this is a way that we see our refueling architecture as Orbit Fab. Um, we have two classes of vehicles um, on a high level. We have uh, shuttles and we have depots. Uh, the depots are responsible for getting fuel into space as effectively and efficiently as possible. So they're very high fuel mass vehicles, um, not necessarily large vehicles, although they can be depending on the situation. Um, those are launched to LEO, GEO, and Cislunar and everywhere in between. Um, as it turns out, um, there's a pretty good economic case to be made for Earth launched refueling in, in all of those orbits. And that even gets better um, when we're sourcing it from the moon. And then fuel shuttles are responsible for taking the fuel from the depots and uh, delivering it to clients um, in their respective orbits. And so um, with this refueling architecture, really the client doesn't have to do too much other than hold a heading and we come to them and fuel them. Next. So as you all are are probably familiar, and many of you have probably heard some of Orbit Fab's presentations in the past. Um, we just opened our UK office, and so um, we've had a, a presence in the in the European area for a year or so now. Um, we're really focused on launching propellant from Earth, obviously, since the Moon is is not quite there. But long term, um, for Kind of the, the best economic efficiency. We're really looking at propellant produced in situ. We're looking at propellant produced from the moon, from asteroids and from other um, celestial bodies. So that in my opinion is really what's going to enable and make permanent the bustling in space economy between earth, moon, Mars and beyond. 
Um, and as it turns out, um, there's a pretty good case to be made that it's economically preferable to use propellant from the moon, even as far down as geo. It's easier to get to geo from the surface of the moon than it is to get to geo from the surface of the earth, even with uh, the slightly higher cost of or sometimes a significantly higher cost of producing propellant on the surface of the moon. Um, so I want to make the case here that the first step towards in situ sourcing is not cryogens, it's producing water-based storable propellants because we have a lot of infrastructure around the moon already that operates on storable propellants. Everything from lunar satellites, to cislunar satellites, to lunar launch vehicles. All of them are built for storable propellants and use storable propellants. And so it makes sense that, um, especially given the, the storability of storable propellants, that's somewhere that we should really focus on uh, putting an effort and trying to see if we can close that economic loop. Um, when I say storable propellants, the two that I'm, I'm primarily thinking of are high test peroxide and water. Those are the two primary propellants. High test peroxide is obviously a little bit higher impulse, but water is also has its place as a, as a simpler propellant, so to speak. So we're working on building a, a resource ecosystem. Um, we have a tool called Suite, which enables uh, space resource architecture design. If you're more, if you're interested in that, go ahead and reach out to me or someone else at Orbit Fab. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about that and see how we can uh, help you design a, a lunar architecture and help, help companies work together to make sure that the lunar architectures we're all building are going to line up once we actually get there. Uh, next. So just wrapping up here, I mentioned uh, we now have a, U a UK office. Most of our team is based in Colorado, but we now have uh, Manny Shar and Sebastian Hill based out of uh, Harwell, UK. Um, we're part of a number of programs in Europe, um, continuing to grow, continuing to make great progress there, and that's just kicking off. So, um, also, if you're uh, if you're looking for an awesome job building space infrastructure, um, we're also continuing to hire in the UK for technical and non-technical roles. So, um, go ahead and reach out if you're interested, and if you have more questions for me, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find me on on LinkedIn or on the OrbitFab website. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks, Connor, for the really interesting presentation. And if you've got any questions for him, please direct them to the online platform where he can answer directly there. Uh, so up next, we have uh, David Rodriguez from EPFL, who will be talking to us today about the design of a lunar reconnaissance drone for exploration and high-resolution mapping of extreme, hardly accessible locations. Welcome. Thanks. Um, here we go. Um, I wanted to, to come here and present very briefly the results of a feasibility analysis and a preliminary design study that we did over the past year or so uh, on the design of this lunar drone. And this was done by a group of graduate students uh, who actively participated in this project and actually came up with the results that I'm going to present to you uh, here today. And it all started with the premise of how we can actually uh, make a significant impact on the efficiency of the exploration. So as you are all very aware of, uh, one of the many issues we have with robotic prospection missions is the lack of high resolution, even sometimes low resolution, uh, topographical and geomorphological data. And this was mentioned a few times yesterday, but with uh, most missions aiming at South Polar PSRs and TSRs and also lunar skylights, um, this is, is something that uh, so well, the, the maps that we have currently from, from those regions are of a resolution that is not even equivalent to the characteristic lengths of the robotic systems that will be deployed on those missions. And this information is actually very hard to, sometimes even impossible to acquire from orbital observations. So with that in mind, we started uh, to evaluate the idea of designing a autonomous, lightweight, compact and reusable lunar drone for characterizing and high resolution mapping of interesting and particularly challenging locations on the lunar surface. And uh, so the, the general idea was to design a lunar drone that could assist 
other uh, robotic systems or vehicles operating on the surface of the moon. And for that, we, the initial concept of operations that we envisioned uh, was formed by a payload envelope, if you want to call it that, that was formed by two systems, one the drone and the other one what we call the service station that was located initially in our initial concept of operations on top of the vehicle or the robotic system to be assisted. So the service station would act as a takeoff and landing pad, as a refueling and recharging station for the drone, a shelter for the drone when not in operation, and also as a depot for major data transfers between the drone and the vehicle or any other you know, robotic assets that could be in the surroundings. Um, the way it worked initially, uh, it's very simple, you can see it there. It's basically the rover would approach a region that is deemed hardly accessible or maybe we don't have enough information about. Then the uh, hatch of the service station will open, the drone uh, will take off and climb to an altitude of about 50 meters above ground level. The drone will follow a predefined trajectory, taking as many images as we can at centimeter level resolution and then come back and safely land on the uh, service station again. Data will be shared, as I mentioned before, with the rover and other assets in the surroundings, and this can be repeated multiple times over the course of, of the mission. Now, this has a few problems. Uh, two of the major limitations is one interfacing with other vehicles and, and rovers. I don't know how keen uh, you know, vehicle operators will be uh, about firing forward thrusters engines on top of any vehicle that they own. Uh, that's one. The other one was that in order to keep the quote unquote intelligence of the drone at the bare minimum, we needed to hold the vehicle in position while the, ro while the drone was operating. Uh, so then we started to think about uh, a trailer instead. So basically putting the service station on wheels. And uh, this meant increasing a bit the overall mass of the whole system, but at the same time, it simplified a lot of the interfaces and uh, it enabled the uh, possibility to use in parallel the drone and the assisted, the assisted vehicle. And this is with the kind of like the concept of operations that we went for. Here you can see the conceptual design of both the service station trailer and the drone without the protective panels. Uh, I don't have enough time to go over all the details. It's a 350 page report that, that we built out of this uh, one year study, but I'll give you a few highlights. So the, the overall wet mass of the whole system, trailer and drone included, is about 100 kilograms. Um, this configuration allows us to uh, achieve about nine kilometers of, of flight distance mapped, uh, which is equivalent to about 11 flights. The uh, service station was designed with a two wheel configuration, uh, 20 centimeter wheels, actuated arms on each of the wheels, so this allows us to play with the clearance of the service station and also the, the uh, attitude in, in roll, so we can have a flat bed for the, for the drone to take off and land, even on highly uneven terrains. The drone, as I, as I briefly mentioned, uh, has a, a four monopropellant engine configuration, and uh, well, this is something that is worth mentioning. So we, we baseline the design on off-the-shelf components just to make things easier and also to have some numbers to work with. So initially, we baseline the design on hydrazine-based monopropellant thrusters. The idea, of course, would be to move towards more you know, sustainable and reusable um, you know, uh, uh, like peroxide type of engines that allows us to then uh, make the case for reusability of the, all the refueling tanks on both the drone and the service station. There are plenty of things that we still need to look into. Uh, two of the major ones is the whole thermal characterization, particularly the takeoff and landing. Uh, that's something that we did some preliminary simulations on, but we have to still look into uh, a lot more. The other one is the control aspect of the drone. It's non-trivial to control a system with such a propulsion system uh, on board. And so we have performed some simulations and, and, the, and we have some, even some preliminary results, some, some failure modes analysis of what happens if an engine fails, what is the strategy for that. Very similar to how we use drones on, on Earth, really, when it comes to the actual implementation of that. Um, but, but that's something that we still need to look into. Overall, we deem the, um, the technology quite feasible and also realizable with currently existing components. And, and we're really excited to, to see what, what may come next. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention.
Thank you very much for the really interesting presentation. And please, if you've got any questions, feel free to put them online or hold off, and then you can ask them in person in the room as well. Uh, so next up, we have uh, Roberto Toro for ISA, from ESA, and um, he's going to be talking about low binder brick, low binder content bricks, a regolith-based solution for sustainable surface construction on the moon. Thanks. Okay. So good afternoon, my name is Roberto Torre. Uh, I'm a research fellow at ESA ESC, European Astronaut Center in Germany, Köln. And today I'm gonna talk to you about a solution we might think uh, might help us to enable a sustainable surface construction on the moon. So when we talk about uh, infrastructures, we are talking about big structures. Imagine uh, habitats, roads, shelters, something really big, which means that we have uh, significant quantities of material to handle, process, and assembly. Um, in the past, we have been discussing about several technologies that can help us handle uh, and process regolith, but, and of course, focusing on using in situ resources is the key. But probably it's not the only um, aspect on which we need to focus. We also need to focus on the power demand, which needs to keep, be kept low. We need to focus on uh, uh, limit the process complexity and to have a process which is robust enough. Those two concepts are linked together and they are also linked in the possibility to translate this into a payload concept. So within Space GPIC, which is my, my team, we are trying to follow an approach of finding a reasonable uh, compromise between uh, the process complexity and the fact that we might bring a little amount of material from the earth. What if by bringing something we might get a process which is really simple and really automatable, really robust? So the idea is really simple. So we mix uh, in powder form and in dry form, uh, regulate within a thermoplastic binder. We compact those powders with a low pressure and we bake them so that the binder melts. Uh, we um, knew that this might have worked because we already get, had some experience on that. Uh, last year in the same conference, a colleague of us presented the idea of mixing uh, the ESC1A, the regular cement we are using together with um, PLA to get a filament for 3D printing. In that case, uh, my colleague needed to use a lot of PLA because the filament needed to be flexible enough to go inside the printing head and to be printed. So we thought that maybe if we fix the shape of the part that we want to produce, so let's think about a construction break, maybe the, um, the process can be streamlined and the amount of material can be easily reduced. So you can see in the picture that uh, in one of the preliminary uh, activities we performed, we went from 20% of PLA to 5% of PLA and we always obtained parts which are solid, uniform and with a stony aspect. We also noticed that the shape retention improved with the regolith content. It was also easier to extract them from the mold, and we also get, got less major defects. Um, so starting from these three uh, steps, mixing, compaction, and baking, we tried to see if we could expand them to better understand the process and to better understand how to control it. So from three steps, we are now discussing about six steps, we added saving, the first one at the beginning, because we didn't know if, whether it was better to use the full profile of granulometric size distribution or whether it was better to use finer particles or bigger particles, for example. Weight and mix is trivial, of course. We need to uh, have a uniform distribution of the binder with the regolith to get a solid part. Then we need to fill the mold. Uh, in this step, the third one, it's really important uh, to uh, make the powders flat because they are not going to, uh, let's say, flow once we, compact the, once we compact them. The compaction, of course, is very important because it's the step in which we enhance the possibility of the binder to wet the regolith later. And as you can see in the picture on your right, uh, we, did with, we, we did this sorry, with the hand press equipped with the 200 kilograms load cell, which gives you already the idea of the low pressures we, we were using. 
baking, of course, we need to melt the thermoplastic, but we didn't know if, whether it was better to use high temperature, low temperature, or whether it was necessary to keep them in the oven for a long or a short time. And cool down is the phase in which the strength is developed because the, the polymer becomes um, solid enough, no, no more fluid. Um, so once we understood that we could do some solid parts, we started to think which kind of parts we, we could manufacture. And we thought about uh, functional part for mechanical tests because when we talk about construction, mechanical properties are one of the first thing we are interested to. So we thought about compression properties and flexural properties because they are those uh, a civil engineer will look for when uh, we want to build something. Um, of course, this kind of material is somehow new, so there is no standardized, uh, standardized uh, test we might follow. So we took inspiration for, from the standardized tests from concretes, but we adapted the dimensions to those um, uh, we usually use when we want to test reinforced polymers. Um, so here I would like to follow on the pictures you see on the right because that's, uh, that is the mold we use to manufacture the flexural specimens. You can see that it's rectangular, it's, it can be filled from the above, it is dismantable, and it has already an interesting dimension. It is 15 centimeters. So uh, just picture in your mind that mold with another shape, maybe an interlockable one, and you have um, an idea of the target we would like to reach. So going back to the compression properties, with this slide, I would like to show you some of the preliminary results we got. Uh, the compression properties are really important when we talk about construction. And here we evaluate um, their um, behavior with respect to the amount of PLA, so the binder we put inside. Uh, it's in the range of 5 to 20%. And we also compare the effect of the compaction uh, pressure we used. You see that the values of the compaction pressure are low. We are talking about 0 0.5 megapascal and 5 megapascal. And this is like one of the most important uh, thing in this project. Um, so it's really easy to compress those specimens with 5 megapascal. But if you want to build um, a brick, which is, let's say, 15 centimeters by 10 centimeters in uh, cross-section and you want to compress it with 5 megapascal, you have to uh, deliver almost 8,000 kilograms. So uh, let's think about this. We need to keep this value low because otherwise it will not be feasible. Um, in order to give a meaning to the compression strength we see here in this slide, uh, I would like to, um, sh to compare the values we just saw uh, with the values of compression strength we use on the earth to manufacture uh, bricks we actually use for building something. You see bricks for industrial uh, floor, building bricks, hollow and facing bricks, pedestrian and light traffic paving. And you see that the two curves almost cross uh, the whole ranges. Uh, so this is interesting because it tells us that already on the earth, these bricks would work. Um, but it also tells us that we would have the possibility even to tailor the mechanical properties we need uh, as a function of the target, we would like to, to, to address them. Uh, so um, it's trivial, of course, but uh, an example could be if we want to build something that needs to be really strong, so let's think about the, the base part of a column, maybe you can use more binder or compress it with a higher pressure, but on the contrary, if we only need to, um, let's say, solidify a certain amount of uh, of regolith, we only need a few percentages of PLA. Um, we wanted to go a little bit more into the details of the process. Uh, we tried to understand how the process parameters uh, could influence the mechanical properties, and we also wanted to study the flexural properties of the samples. So in this slide, uh, I wish I'm showing you the results of a design of experiment activity we performed. Uh, we are talking about 16 samples, uh, which were manufactured with the different combination of process parameters, and they were then repeated a certain number of times, so to have uh, a result which was significantly, uh, which had the meaning from the statistical point of view. We considered the binder weight percentage, the grain size of the particles, the compression pressure, the baking temperature, the baking time, and the cooling speed. Uh, we had different number of levels, so you have four levels for the PLA weight percentage, four levels for the grain size, 
and two levels for the other parameters. And you can see that uh, this investigation told us that baking temperature, baking time, and cooling speed, they do not play a significant role, which means that uh, we can have the bricks really fast because we can cool them faster. Uh, we do not need long baking times. You see that we are talking about 20, 40 minutes, and we, don't need, uh, we do not need high temperature. We only need to melt the polymer. At the same time, it confirmed the, the, the effect of the, the percentage of binder, and it tells us that either we don't need to sieve the regolith to have uh, only the finer uh, part of the granulometric distribution because uh, the as-received regolith was already good enough. Uh, it also confirms the, the effect of the pressure. You will see that the values of the compression pressure here are lower than the ones you saw in the previous slide, and the reason is only due to the dimension of the specimen. So with that hand press, we could not compress those specimens, which are bigger, uh, with the pressure which was higher than 0 0.5 megapascal. Uh, of course, this represents the starting point of our activity. Uh, we will need to evaluate the behavior of the samples with thermal gradients, vacuum, radiations, and impacts, and this will, will help us to frame those components to define the application scenarios and infrastructure. Uh, we will need also to work on the form finding on the, of the infrastructures so that we can define the tessellation, the shapes, and how to interlock them. And we already started. We need to work on the ISRU pilot design to enable this uh, automatable manufacturing technique and assembly. And so with this, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, so feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Roberto. Um, we're going to skip the next uh, question session in the interest of time and combine it with the next question session if we have time. Um, so we'll move straight on to the next talk. Uh, we've got up next Daniel Inocente from Blue Origin, and he's going to be talking to us about enabling permanent lunar architecture. Do we ask? Okay. Hello, everyone. I uh, just want to make sure everyone understands this. So I do work for Blue Origin, but what I'm sharing with you, with you today is mostly my work as an architect. So I'm here to inspire some thinking about future um, habitation and infrastructure on the moon. W one of the things um, I think we all are working towards is development. And what that means is construction. Um, in many ways, we already have a lot of experience working in extreme environments like in the Antarctic, for example. And what you see here is a station designed for the purpose of studying the Antarctic and to understand the history of the Earth, to understand the impact of global climate change, and to try to really you know, understand how we can build the systems and the processes to get um, habitation and other infrastructure to a very remote and um, hard to live in environment. This is not the only example. There are many countries um, throughout the world working on stations. And what's really incredible about this is that over the last 100 years, scientists and explorers, builders, engineers have been uh, building ways of manufacturing and assembling stations in, in the Antarctic. Um, and more recently, I think architects have become involved because as we start to develop these stations looking towards the future, you have to imagine you know, people want to live and work in an environment that is conducive to the work and the science that needs to take place there. Um, and so these are just some examples of the stations. There's many um, examples of this. But the key to this is learning how to build. How do you construct? And so, um, for example, in, on the left you have the Concordia station. And what you see here is you see prefabricated elements being assembled on site. And so that means that you have to build it before you build it. Um, and a lot of these relies on the transport and the shipping. And so all of the logistics have to be planned out very methodically from the moment you manufacture this in a facility somewhere on the other part of the planet to the moment you install it on its final location. Um, similarly, you see here um, one of the piers being built for the Rothera Research Station where they're basically enabling and expanding the ability to receive more materials to continue building and expanding on their station. And so these are just some of the processes that I think we can learn from, especially since in the building sector there's a lot of um, 
um, near-term applications that could also be evolved. Now, going to space is going to be, of course, more challenging, but a lot of the methodologies can be adapted. And we, when you start to think about the infrastructure that will be required for going to the moon, um, you're going to need transportation. You're going to need crew landers. You're going to need logistic landers. Um, more recently, there's heavy lift landers that might, we might see in the near term. Um, you're going to need to be able to build, so robotic construction, autonomous systems um, that can perform things like excavation, <clears throat> transporting, um, 3D printing. Then, of course, you're also going to need habitation systems, which I think is still one of the most important elements that are going to be necessary to build um, long-term development projects on the moon. And what's really challenging is how do you identify all of the technology gaps that we need to bridge to get to that point? Because there's a lot of technologies out there that when you start to scale up some of the processes and techniques that people have been talking about, like ISRU extracting oxygen, for example, um, how do you scale that up? How do you make it usable so that the end, um, the, the end use could be streamlined? And there's a lot of um, infrastructure on both sides of that equation that has yet to be designed or built. Um, but NASA has, for example, a taxonomy, which is very clearly outlined and can help us think about how we categorize and how we implement some of these technologies as we start to have continue to evolve them. Um, the taxonomy goes from everything, including material science, all the way to in situ construction. And I think also in Europe, you see that this taxonomy is being applied. I mean, similar technologies are being evolved here. Um, and if you take a deeper dive into this taxonomy, um, some of the things I highlight are environmental control and life support systems, because habitats, you can't design a habitat unless you simulate the environment that we experience on Earth inside of that habitation. And then, of course, you're also going to need um, energy. So there's many ways of harnessing the energy on the moon, whether it's from the resources underneath um, the astronauts' feet or from capturing the energy coming from the sun um, and habitation. So habitation, like I, get, like I said before, is for me one of the most critical components of that. And in my work, I've had the opportunity to collaborate with partners such as Lockheed Martin, where we designed um, a small-scale settlement, a small-scale station on the moon, really with the focus on the human experience. Again, going back to this idea that architecture at some point for lunar application will have to evolve to the point where the human really becomes a center of that building, of that facility, to help enhance the way that people are working. <clears throat> and what you see here is you see almost like another evolution of what space architecture might become in the future, where you have the working functions, you have the living functions, um, all of this architecturally composed so that as you're inside the space, you know, it becomes conducive to your well-being and cognitive performance. One of the projects um, that I had the opportunity to work on was in collaboration with the European Space Agency and faculty at MIT. This one was called the Moon Village. And for that project, we looked into the feasibility of a habitat that would be a multi-story hybrid architecture. Um, what was really great about this project was we worked together with experts throughout ESA. Um, and we performed the CDF, and we looked at every single trade that you see on the right, everything from structures to environmental protection, power. You know, we really tried to dig into the details of what it would take to build, to engineer and build a habitat of this scale and this complexity. Um, and maybe we'll get there, you know, maybe we're not there, obviously we're not there yet, but at some point in time, you know, the architects will come in and they'll say, okay, here are all the technologies that we need, how can we integrate them, how can we implement them, can we come up with better solutions for humans to live in space? And over time, I believe that this will allow us and enable us to build more infrastructure, and now we're talking about bringing machinery where you can actually do in situ construction, you can build habitats from native materials, and I want to share with you guys um, a video that kind of takes you through a journey about this idea that in order to get infrastructure to be implemented, you need to start with some of the most basic components, habitation, power, infrastructure, um, and I hope you enjoy it. So. More than 50 years have passed since humans last traveled to the moon, and there's still much we don't know about the brightest object in our night sky. What would it mean to return to the moon today, to leave more than flags and footsteps, to create a sustainable home? 
It would open new avenues for science. It could kickstart an outer space economy. And it would allow us to create a new kind of community to discover how we might live together beyond the Earth. The European Space Agency's concept for a moon village is an international endeavor, bringing together governments, industry, and perhaps private entrepreneurs to support a permanent human presence on the moon. If an earlier era of space exploration was driven by competition, this one will be defined by collaboration. take to truly thrive in space? How can we make the moon feel like home? Built from a rigid composite frame and an inflatable structural shell, the habitat maximizes usable space and creates a sense of openness on four levels. The first phase of development will allow crews to live, work, and continue building the settlement. Gradually, additional infrastructure and equipment will arrive, and new habitation units can serve functions such as food production and science operations. Eventually, the Moon Village will grow into a thriving community, a hub for science, exploration, and even tourism. Visible from everywhere on Earth, the moon has always given humans something to aspire to, a place to set our sights on. And soon, it will be a place we might call home. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for that uh, really inspiring video. Um, up next, we have Robert Lindner from ESA ESTEC, and he's going to be telling us a bit about the facilities at ESTEC. Welcome. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, after this very inspiring talk from Daniele, and now we are getting back down to earth to some, let's say, more nitty gritty kind of details. So um, I'm gonna just give you a quick snapshot on the facilities we have in ESA Aztec in Nordwijk, and now let's say research and technology center of the European Space Agency, which can serve and which are being used uh, for ISIU related activities. So uh, one of the first ones, which may look a little bit odd to you, uh, is, uh, let's say, our gravity simulation lab we are having in, um, in ESA, so gravity simulation. We are not, let's say, simulating microgravity, obviously, but by different means, we can actually access what uh, certain phenomena would look like under reduced gravity. And we do that for instance, very, in a very simple way by using a centrifuge, our so-called large diameter centrifuge, which enables us to perform experiments under high G 
uh, for, let's say, um, essentially unlimited amount of time, depending on what it is. It was primarily built in order to uh, enable high gravity or gravity-related research for life and physical science instrumentation, but can be as well used for ISIU processes. So the idea behind it is very simple, is that we use what some people may call the gravity paradoxon, but it, in fact it's not a paradoxon, it's more or less looking at the continuum. So if I have a certain effect and I do measurements under high gravity levels, I can establish a trend. And if I extrapolate this trend to, let's say, gravity regime, which is simply not accessible to me or rather more difficult accessible, uh, I can see already what's going to happen, for instance, at lunar or in Martian gravity, simply by extrapolating it. So we have this facility, which uh, consists of uh, this centrifuge where we can mount several gondolas. We can provide up to 20 G maximum as a, let's say, G-force. We can uh, accommodate payloads up to 80 kilograms inside the gondolas, and we provide, let's say, data, power, video, and as well fluidic interfaces inside the gondola. These experiments, as I said before, can run for a few minutes, or, for instance, sometimes important for biological experiments, even two weeks to several weeks. We use that as well for ISIU, for instance, and in looking at the uh, drill peak forces uh, during penetration for specific kind of uh, you know, ultrasonic drills, for instance, where we somehow uh, had a certain model prediction. In the end of the day, it showed that you know, the test itself showed quite, similar, uh, quite different values in this respect. Then we have now recently established uh, a new, say, play corner, which we call the ISAU lab where we are uh, now really focusing on oxygen and metal production processes, at the moment mostly on molten salt electrolysis. We have uh, three uh, reactors or cells we can run at the moment. Um, we can have as well furnaces in order to condition, for instance, material to do sintering under inert or vacuum operations. We have uh, the monitoring means in terms of mass spectrometry in order to look at the evolved gases. Uh, vacuum drying ovens are available, and then, of course, subsequently, all the product analysis, because that's what's then becoming interesting. So we can provide, for instance, uh, information about the oxygen content by doing elemental analysis. Uh, we can do titration on the salts in order to look at the oxygen content or calcium oxide. As an example, we can do analysis using X-ray diffraction, fluorescence. We have micro CT. Um, uh, facilities as well, Raman, FDIR, SEM, TEM, and as well, let's say, very dedicated mechanical testing, which is being used from our colleagues uh, in the sister sections. So issues like tensile strength, compressive strength testing, micro-indentation, all these facilities are there and available. Then, of course, when it comes, for instance, to integration uh, activities, uh, we have clean room facilities ranging from ISO 8 to ISO 1, which on the, let's say, on the lower scale of the ISO uh, classification is quite unique. And then worth a complete presentation by itself is, of course, our test center, where we can do environmental tests, launch loads, etc., everything you need in order to qualify your spaceflight hardware. So I'll be short on that one. Then, of course, we have as well the automation and robotics labs from our colleagues uh, from our sister section where we have different, let's say, dedicated lab platforms, for instance, for planetary robotics, where you can look at locomotion on planetary surfaces, robotic perception, autonomy, navigation, and task-based commanding. So they have a 9 by 9 meter test bed, and you've seen uh, this morning in a nice presentation from GMB as well, one of the practical applications for that. Then the orbital robotics lab, Things like orbital assembly and servicing, so appending to uh, you know, issues like, for instance, refueling, docking, things like that, debris removal, dealing with uncooperative objects, for instance, uh, in a, say, low, a simulated low gravity environment on a, let's say, friction less floor of nine by five meters are possible. And then in terms of human robotic interactions, we have the uh, HRI lab giving us the opportunity for real-time teleoperations of complex robotic systems, force feedback control, for instance, for robotic arms and as well for rovers. So I stop here and uh, I put in some links if you want to have some more information and you can contact me anytime in this respect or catch up with me during the coffee break.
Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, so next up, we've got uh, Jürgen Schlutz from ESA as well. Um, and he's going to be telling us about preparing for lunar exploration, the ESA DLR Lunar Analog uh, Facility in Cologne. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. So we've been hearing already over the past one and a half days a lot about different activities that are happening at ESA across the European community, I would say. But one facility, one element, I think has still been a bit missing, and that's something that I want to report about uh, today, and that is the Lunar Analog Facility that we're setting up in Cologne. Um, and I want to emphasize that this is a joint activity between ESA and DLR, the German Space uh, Research Center. Um, which has a large campus already in Cologne, a lot of expertise around human spaceflight and about different aspects of space research. At the same time, we have the European Astronaut Center there, um, where, where I work, where a lot of my colleagues work, and where we, are, where we have already advanced a lot of technologies that are preparing us for lunar exploration. And the Lunar Analog Facility is really meant to be a central piece in that, in terms of the ambition of Europe to become uh, um, really a core player in lunar exploration. So moving uh, forward in that is that Luna is meant to be really a collaborative project of DLR and ESA in that competence cluster of Cologne, but also inviting all of our partners in for various opportunities. And um, I want to, to, uh, to emphasize that there, are, that there are very diverse opportunities I apologize a little bit um, in advance for those that have heard about Luna already in past uh, events. So there, there is, this has been conceptualized over a long period of time already, a couple of years, and now it's really picking up speed and we're investing about 45 million across uh, ESA, DLR, and the federal state of Northern Westphalia in the next five years to set up really a moon center in Cologne that is central to the technology and innovation for space research, for space um, applications across different domains that is um, for the scientific research, for the science that we want to do on the moon in order to prepare, but also um, for training our scientists, our personnel, our operators, um, our astronauts eventually to go to the lunar surface. And it's supposed to have a low barrier entry for the larger community um, in Europe. So we see on this picture already all the activities that will eventually be done on the lunar surface. Um, the astronauts that are working with robots in collaboration on the surface, the construction of facilities. We've heard about that uh, already in the, the last couple of, of, um, of talks. Very diverse infrastructure that will be set up on the moon. And there are a lot of activities associated to that that need to be well understood before, that need to be done before, that need to be prepared. Um, and for that, Luna is the facility that shall deliver that, including also a relevance within, obviously, our partner's Artemis program. So when we looked at conceptualizing Luna, we realized that there is um, different activities already ongoing in the field, in terms of geological training, but also technology, demonstration analog activities in the field. But they have issues with logistics. They have issues with weather. They have issues with reprodu uh, reproducibility of the environmental conditions. So they have their strengths, but they also have their weaknesses. The same applies for all the activities that are happening, I would say, on a lab scale, uh, especially in robotics, in different labs, um, in, in system level, on subsystem level for developing technologies. And then we have all the operational landscape around the ISS. And we felt that there is a gap of bringing a lot of this expertise together in a larger scale facility that allows reproducible activities on a simulated lunar surface, qualifying different aspects of the lunar environment. And that's Luna, that's our, our answer to that is the Luna Analog Facility. This is a sketch of what that's supposed to mean. When I say Luna Facility, it's really a bit of a facility of facilities, if you want to speak in that system of systems engineering sense, that while it is one building, it houses a lot of opportunities. The main element of Luna is the moon surface simulation area. So what you see here, we are talking about, uh, about a 700 square meter field filled with about 900 tons of regular simulants. So we're not 
speaking about just little bits and pieces of, of sand, of, of simulant material here, but we're speaking about really a larger scale area where astronauts, several astronauts at a time can move, where robots can, can really properly move um, with astronauts, where we can set up infrastructure and work on connecting bits and pieces, deploying instruments or other elements on the lunar surface, or on the simulated lunar surface. Um, we, are we have a, a head building to that, which has um, preparatory rooms for everything that we want to bring into the lunar hall eventually. We have laboratory rooms. Um, we've been uh, hearing this morning already about uh, what we call the dust lab. So an, an uh, enclosed room where we can work with different simulants and we can work uh, under on understanding also the impact of those materials of the dust on robotic systems, on seals, on materials, and really working with it in a, in a, prop, in a more, much more dusty environment than we want, want to have it in the, in the rest of the main hall. We have a gas laboratory where we can work on, with industrial gases on aspects of IRSIU processes, but also um, of uh, um, 3D printing or uh, construction elements uh, with the lunar regulus. We have, for the first time, this large scale facility and amount of lunar simulant available to really do these kind of activities. And uh, um, Luna is meant to be an open platform, an open hub to the community. We want all of you to eventually bring your ideas to Luna, bring your systems to Luna, and to find out how we can best prepare them to be then deployed for lunar exploration in the future. Alongside the main building, we are also working on implementing um, external modules. Some of them are already well established, well developed. For example, the Eden facility that has been developed by DLR and other partners that has been running in Antarctica already for, for plant growth in um, extreme environments will be brought to Cologne. Uh, in, in about two years' time, it's coming back from Antarctica right now, will be upgraded, will be re, uh, re, retrofitted, and will come to um, Cologne to be part of a simulated moon base. And we will very soon this year also um, start interacting with the community, but also eventually um, bring out a call to look for how we want to simulate, how we want to establish lunar base elements around Luna to properly understand how we can use um, the lunar external surface that we simulate with the interior spaces that we have to develop elements of the ingress, egress procedures, dust mitigation procedures, but then also the work that astronauts need to do inside a habitat, including full end-to-end -end simulations, potentially, um, of lunar surface missions. I already mentioned that the facility Luna really is embedded in a larger competence cluster. And when we look at this, uh, the site of Cologne, we have the European Astronaut Center. Luna will be built right opposite to that on the lower left here. Um, but there's a couple of other facilities, especially of DLR, that are meaningful to, the, to, that, um, to the central role of Luna and to the, our preparation for Luna exploration. That is around all the aspects of human physiology research, with the Institute of Aerospace Medicine and the NB Hub facility, but also the Competence Center for Aerospace Medicine by DLR and the um, uh, German Armed Forces. But we also have all the expertise around material physics, the solar furnace that had been used for looking at solar sintering of regolith material, um, but also the operational expertise of the Microgravity User Support Center, MUSC, and the European Astronaut Center, obviously, where we are embedded in the real-time operations of the International Space Station. And that's a strong element that we have, that we can do all this preparation for lunar exploration in a meaningful operational setup. So this slide actually just lists a couple of the technology and innovation items, the, the elements that we really want to simulate in Luna or that we have in Luna. And I want to touch just on a couple of them to give you a little bit of an update on, on where we are. Um, so we're talking reduced gravity. The, a hall will actually feature what we call a gravity offloading system. We currently have two studies running um, with companies to look at potential different implementations of such a system where we work with a constant force offloading mechanism, but then also mobility throughout the whole 700 square meters hall to actually have two astronauts work 
together at the same time while offloaded to 16G. Um, but potentially also rovers or other robots could be offloaded uh, with this uh, gravity offloading system to experience at least a sense of the reduced gravity while moving on the simulated lunar surface. We are looking at illumination. So we want to, inside the hall, really represent illumination conditions like they would be on the moon at the best level. And that is, um, we are, we'll have a dark hall eventually, and we'll have, like we'll have on the, on the polar areas on the moon, illumination that, that will be difficult to handle in terms of the illumination angles, in terms of the shadows um, that there are, and, and, that will, uh, and we will really want to put those challenges um, into our simulations in order to understand how we operate in future. I already mentioned the dust laboratory and the gas laboratory. We can obviously do terrain modeling with this size of a facility. Um, it is, will actually be the next home for what we see here on the left, the Argonaut lander. The facility is large enough to bring this, um, this uh, mock-up into the facility and properly understand how we would run, do procedures like offloading um, of equipment from such a lander. How could you potentially connect infrastructure together? Um, We'll have a system inside for positioning and motion capture to understand, obviously, how we move around. But we also invite everyone who wants to work on this localization aspects to, un to come to Luna and to understand how we can improve that for future lunar surface um, implementation. Our strong element is about the human and robotic interaction. It was mentioned by Matthias already in his talk. It's never about the human or the robot. It's both of them together. And that's what we want to achieve in Luna. When we talk regenerative power system or innovative construction, you see those two points here. Then I'm talking about the external modules. We're talking about how can we simulate elements of a lunar base around lunar habitation, laboratory spaces, but potentially also regenerative energy systems, so solar arrays, fuel cell systems, battery systems that might be deployed um, as technology demonstration elements, but also as um, operational elements for some of the lunar base elements that we want to put um, outside of Luna. Local comms networks is addressing that we potentially can bring in um, the, the network capability or the, the communication infrastructure the way it would be deployed on the lunar surface. We might have demonstration of moonlight capabilities in this hall. We might have other um, elements of simulating time delays and other things um, within the facility. And then we're also talking about virtual reality and augmented reality integration so that we can even, even though we have a large facility, further extend um, the capabilities within, into the virtual spaces. And obviously, having a facility like that is a very strong point when it comes to outreach and education and really taking the community, but also the public, along. And we see a lot of interest already in lunar exploration all over Europe, all over the world. And this facility will be one where people can really experience it to a certain extent. So in the next um, couple of slides, I also want to take you a bit more into Luna. This is, first of all, and I don't want to dwell on that very much, the international context that you all are aware well in this, um, in, 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 in this group of people, that there is this renaissance of lunar exploration. But there is really a strong ambition of Luna to, Luna has the capability, the potential, to be a unique facility that is unparalleled worldwide. And that is interesting in that respect, um, that will put Europe on a map of future lunar exploration. So we have the ambition to really train all future moon astronauts eventually in Cologne to prepare the technology elements and even full mission simulations um, on the ground, maybe even be um, a ground uh, parallel to, to actual missions that happen on the surface in terms of maintenance, in terms of uh, failure uh, assessment and, report and, and mitigation strategies. And it all fits within the, uh, the European strategy of having a European astronaut on the moon within this decade. So taking you a bit into the Luna facility and giving you a little bit of an update on where we stand. Luna, as mentioned, it has been conceptualized over a couple of years already. Now we have everything in place. We have the funding in place from ESA, DLR, and the Federal State of Northern Australia. I already mentioned that. The construction is really planned to start um, next month. We are in the final stages uh, with a construction company to discuss that. And the building is supposed to be ready by the first quarter of next year. 
We're currently expecting probably February um, as for the building ready, and then the technical outfitting starts. And we're preparing already now the gravity offloading, the solar illumination, simulation, and all the other aspects. Um, so we'll need a couple of months to probably pr prepare the facility for first operations. But we expect that to happen in the second or third quarter. So let's maybe say summer uh, 24 is when the facility will really be ready to represent the moon on Earth. And what that will look like, I want to show you. Let's see if that runs automatically or not. I want to show you a quick video. Yes. And maybe we'll, we'll keep the, the sound down because I want to give you a little bit of a guided tour, if you want, of the, of the Luna facility. This is our virtual reality model of the facility. We actually have that also outside. If you want to visit the ESA booth, you can experience it yourself with the virtual reality headset, um, taking you into the entrance hall right opposite the, the um, European Astronaut Center that you just saw. Um, and uh, the facility, the main feature of the facility is the hall. So this is the 700 square meter hall. You see an element of the simulation of the illumination, the size of the hall that can really house properly. Here you see the, the Argonaut lander mock-up in there, uh, different rover systems in there. We can do terrain modeling. We'll have an artificial crater down to a depth of about three meters. So we can work, uh, have slopes. We can have um, inserts potentially even to work on digging, um, on sampling, on, on drilling experiments eventually. We have uh, all, also rooms um, for visitors to experience that uh, uh, from the outside. The preparatory rooms to prepare, I mentioned the dust chamber. This is an enclosed space where we can really stir up the dust, where we can work and understand impacts of dust on, on, um, on systems. And then we have in the head building a couple of uh, facilities that will support us in, in all the preparatory activities in terms of meeting rooms, a visitor room, control rooms, and that then complements the, the, the element of Luna. And what you can see also in this external view is some aspects, no, it actually, no, this one actually, you couldn't see it on the right-hand side, there were aspects of potential modules outside of the facility. So with that, I just want to say a few words um, finally on really what do we want to do in Luna. Um, and we've thought about different utilization scenarios, and I just want to address them just very briefly in the interest of time. So one is a technology platform. We want to bring in technology into Luna to understand how things work with the dust, with the illumination, with the reduced gravity as the main aspects of simulation. But we also want them to be embedded in a fully operational environment. That's why it's an operations platform. It's really for us to understand how we will and develop the concepts of operations of future Luna, uh, Luna missions. Also for the science operations, when we talk about um, geology and, and field and, and EVA activities on the moon, um, and we're closely integrating that with the tools that we're also developing for geology training in, uh, in our field trips. We have an integrated training with um, all the other uh, training expertise that we already have at the site of Cologne. And we can run mission simulations for robotic missions, but also outreach and education for different academia and, and other groups. So we really want to be an open platform. But one of the important aspects for us is also to be relevant for our international partners. And that's uh, mainly Artemis. We can do really EVA simulation and training. And we've been speaking to our NASA partners about that already. We are in the process of actually getting the um, analog suits that NASA is using for their field trips also into Luna and uh, connecting them to our gravity offloading system. So we want to be representative in, in what we do in Luna. Um, we want to be able to do full mission simulations from the initial five to six day missions. That would then include elements of habitation that we need to put outside of the Luna facility. But eventually, we can also do a lot of simulation for future phase two surface infrastructure deployment in terms of understanding how to bring larger uh, infrastructure elements to the lunar surface and train and simulate for that. And that's all that I have for you today. But as I said, please visit us outside and you can experience Luna on your own in the, in the virtual reality. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for that interesting presentation. Um, 
So I hope you don't mind. We're going to swap things around kind of quickly on the fly to make sure we don't cut anyone off mid-talk and we can still catch the launch. Um, so next up, we're going to have Douglas Morrison uh, from the Centre of Excellence in Mining Innovation Canada, and he's going to be talking to us about lunar surface station architecture. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I'm very sorry not to be with you in Luxembourg, but hopefully I will be there next year. Uh, if we go to the next slide, it'll explain who we are and what we do. So, I guess that's messed about a bit, but anyway, the Centre of Excellence in Mining Innovation was started back in 2007 to help mines in Canada improve their performance. And we're trying to basically get the mines to change the way they uh, practice mining as soon as possible. So let's find more ore, mine it more safely and quickly and effectively, generate more value from the ore, the ore or the, from the mines, and have a more benign impact on the environment. So that's kind of who we are. My, I myself have 40 years of experience in mines and in specifically in underground mines, although many of my colleagues have different types of expertise. Next slide, next click. So we have a team of engineers and we're all engineers and we've all worked in many of the conditions that exist around the world. Uh, in every type of condition you can imagine, including high altitude, uh, with large scale, small scale equipment. And the same is true for our process team. All of us are relatively senior in our careers. And so we spend a lot of time working in very difficult conditions. And what that generates is a group of people who are very creative engineers having to cope with the problems that are confront, that confront mining operations anywhere in the world under relatively difficult conditions. And we also have a mega network as part of SEMI, which is well over 100 SMEs who are all mining innovators. Mines typically don't want to change too many things too fast, but it's our job to try and make that happen because if we don't produce two or three times more of the metals that we use now, then there will be no energy transition to a low carbon economy because there simply will not be enough metal to make that happen. Copper, nickel, cobalt, all the critical minerals. So that's our primary task. But the next slide will explain why we are engaged in uh, trying to engage in the mining space. And it's basically because you have to create a safe, secure, and healthy living environment. And I'm pleased that some other people have talked about that earlier today. The big question is really whether that's going to be on surface. Uh, lunar resource utilization uh, is a difficult process, as mining is a difficult process. This is non-trivial engineering. And the problem that we have right now is that the modern earth-moving vehicles that we have been using for the last 40 years or so in the mining industry are large, slow, and energy intensive. Uh, the batch process is also poor uh, energy and time efficiency, roughly about 2% in the end, because 80% of the energy you use is to move the machine, not to move the material that you want to move. And when you do that in a batch process, more than 90% of the time, the thing you want to move remains untouched while the vehicle travels back and forth. So, Rovers are a really good thing to be using for exploration and discovery, but not for commuter transport from A to B and B back to A again, which is typically what mining operations do a great deal of. The alternative that many of us have thought about throughout our careers and have not been able to implement is actually ideas that came from the original uh, equipment that mines used to use way back for the last 100 years or so. These were small, light, energy effective systems, and they were energy effective because some individual had to turn the handle or pull the lever to make it happen. We don't need to do that any longer. We can use electric motors to make most of these things happen, and we can use AI to replace the intelligence of the people who were running the machines. But these machines are small, light, and energy effective, and they can do all the things that we need to do and we've actually discovered that you can actually find some of the models in other industries, like agriculture, for example, the kinds of things we used to do 100 years ago, very simple, robust machines operated by electricity and uh, digital control are much more effective than the systems that we use at the present time because they use far, far less energy and uh, are much more effective at what they do. So that's kind of where our thoughts are going vis-a-vis uh, the kinds of equipment that we use. And if we go to the next slide, since I'm coming to the end of my five minutes, basically 
what we've realized is that in order to create the kind of an environment that we that would be a safe and secure and professional environment for people to live in, underground is actually not a bad place to be. Uh, the temperature remains reasonably constant, even uh, just a few meters underground. What we've had to do, and what our little team has done, is to create the capability for unlimited bedrock drilling in any, any orientation. And once we manage to do that, we realize that we can use the same kinds of techniques to modify or sculpt the bedrock surface. Uh, once the regolith has been removed, we can actually do bedrock excavation in terms of a trench or tunnels or inclines and shafts. And we can do all of those things with the kinds of technologies that we've all seen at times past and bringing in new ideas and new technologies to make them work much, much more effectively than they did, let's say, 100 years ago, because we have new technology. The big problem we have, of course, is, and many people have talked about how we simulate the conditions on Earth that we will find on the Moon. But the conditions, day, night to night time, basically are basically from plus 100 degrees centigrade to minus 200 degrees centigrade. And there's nowhere on Earth that you can go and find a 300 degree transition from one thing to the other every 14 days, which is what's going to happen on the Moon. All the programs that we have seen people walking about on the Moon up until now have been in that, if you look at the picture of the moon at the top, have all been at the dawn dusk period in that small sliver between full daylight and full darkness. And those are difficult places to be. So we can't continue to be restricted simply to that little slice of dawn and dusk. We're gonna to have to figure out how to operate in plus 100 degrees centigrade conditions and very cold conditions, minus 200 when it's in full dark. And since I've lived most of my career in northern Canada, I can tell you that batteries don't do well at minus 40 degrees centigrade. And so we'll have to have what you might think of as uh, respite stations. For every journey that we take with our rovers, we will have to have respite stations where we can provide warmth and power to keep those machines alive, even if there's nobody driving the machine, the, the machine itself will still have to be protected and looked after. So these are the kinds of conditions that most of us in our little team have personal experience of very, very difficult conditions in very, very remote places. And there's nowhere on Earth more difficult and more remote than the surface of the moon. And we think that some of the expertise that we have some of the techniques we've developed, some of the techniques that we are rejuvenating from 100 years ago actually have application to the moon. And I look forward to talking to any of you who might be interested in some group of older gentlemen who have lots of real live experience of the dead ends, technological dead ends that the mining industry has experienced. Very often in mines, when we have a, a new idea that doesn't is not successful, we actually just walk away from the project and nobody wants to think about it anymore. Our little team is one of the few groups that have actually taken the time and effort to figure out why it failed and how it might have been made a success if the mining company had continued on with that approach. That's very rare in our industry. And typically our failures, as you all know, your failures are a much better teacher of lessons than successes. So we think the failures that we've seen in the past are actually the solutions of the future. And with that, I'll stop talking. And hopefully we can watch a magnificent launch. Thank you very much for your attention. for your flexibility with the timing. Um, we've had a lot of interesting questions online, so please keep them coming in. They don't immediately show up on the platform for all of you, but we are seeing them real time, so please keep submitting them. Uh, we're going to pause this session here, but we will come back to it straight after the launch, and now we're going to switch to the, the live launch and hopefully see a successful Currently, launch. we're not hearing a need to hold, so at six minutes, 27 seconds, everything looks good. And of course, Kate Shiva, as we get close, we're going to get into the engine ignition sequence of 33 rafters, and that's going to be something new for everybody. <laughs> I cannot wait for that moment. So for those of you that are familiar with how we launch Falcon 9 rockets, 
you probably know that we light all nine of those first stage Merlin 1D engines all at once. It's pretty different than what we do or what we're attempting to do today. We're actually going to be igniting those 33 engines in banks uh, or clusters. And that sequence starts at T minus six seconds. Yeah, and the ignition sequence is a little bit different, uh, both in terms of the timing and also the ignition method. So on Falcon 9, we use a chemical called T-TAB. It's, it's a pyrophoric material, so that means when you mix the two together, it, it produces a flame that kicks off that green characteristic spark on Falcon 9 missions. But actually on Starship, we use electrical ignition systems. Many of those are integrated on the ground system here. And the electrical ignition, uh, we start lighting the banks at T minus six seconds. And then over the next four seconds, the three sets of banks will ignite and eventually bring uh, the booster up to a thrust to weight greater than one and hopefully ascend. <laughs> Super exciting. Uh, like we said, pretty different from our Falcon 9 launches. And so this will be the first time that any of us have gotten to see this type of, an, of uh, integrated test flight with both the Starship and the Super Heavy booster. Everyone cheering as we get in the team out of five minutes. We want to remind everyone that success today is anything. <laughs> yeah, it looks fun down there. I kind of want to go join them. <laughs> For today, success is anything that we learn that helps improve the future builds of Starship. If we lift off and clear the pad, we're calling that a win. <laughs> A great shot of the pad there, a uh, great shot of the quick disconnect on the second stage. You can see the frost line on the booster where that methane is uh, is fully topped up. Uh, I think we're just coming up on the last few minutes here of, of propellant fill on the booster. And that quick disconnect is going to separate away as we actually get into the ignition se sequence, but it's providing electrical connections now and uh, also providing the propellants that we're loading into the, the vehicle. Yeah. Uh, we're just now under four minutes until liftoff of the Starship flight test. Um, we've been following along for it, what honestly seems like days and days now, but really it kind of comes down to years. <laughs> it, yeah. it has been a long time to get to where we are today. Uh, now, fast forwarding a little bit, um, we have the opportunity to hold, if necessary, at 40 seconds. Um, and we are able to hold there for about 15 minutes uh, or up to 15 minutes uh, and still be able to lift off. Yeah, and that's a little bit different from Falcon uh, for the propellant sequence on Falcon that um, uh, we don't have the opportunity to hold. So that's a cool new capability on Starship. Right now, T minus three minutes, 10 seconds and counting. We got some great views from the drone. It's nice that uh, the fog is slowly lifting. We get some of the blue skies, hopefully good views. What we're waiting for right now is closeout of propellant loading on the first stage. That should be wrapping up here shortly. In fact, it looks like uh, fuel fill and drain valves are coming closed. That means first stage is fully loaded, second stage fully loaded, Net 10 million pounds of propellant on board the Starship launch vehicle. I want to take a quick moment to say that the crowd energy here is electric. I feel like it's Falcon Heavy test demo all over again. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully you'll hear us as we get into the plus count. But right now, next activity is coming up. The flight termination system arms at T minus two minutes. Thrust vector control checkouts at T minus two minutes. And then after that, major activity will be the T minus 40 second gate. There's a view looking up at the 33 Raptor engines. There are 20 engines in a circle on the outside. And as Shiva said earlier, 13 engines on the center. Those are the ones that gimbal and steer the vehicle. <laughs> Love this view. These are the 33 Raptor engines at the base of the super heavy booster. I think we can see those wiggles now. We're currently inside 90 seconds. Next major activity, T minus 40 seconds. That is a gate, a decision point. We're waiting. Possibility the propulsion team may need a few minutes. 
flight termination system is armed for flight. We're getting ready for T minus one minute and counting. Next, we'll see as we get past T minus 40 seconds for final checks of the vehicle. Okay, you can see the clock has recycled. Flight director has called a hold. We are recycling. For the moment, we'll see where they move the clock back to. They could hold at T minus 40 seconds. They could go to an earlier point. Give us a minute to listen into the nets and we'll see if we can get you more information to share. John Innsbrucker again here at the Hawthorne webcast desk. We're holding a T minus 40 seconds. What we've heard so far is we have a couple of issues we're working. One is the booster tank pressurization. Uh, final pressurization was just a little bit uh, long. That's not unusual. We've held a T minus 40 seconds before to pressurize. That appears to have been resolved. At the same time on the second stage, they're working some final purging. Uh, we should know very shortly if that is cleared and if we'll continue the countdown. Everyone, especially that person, is excited <laughs> to keep going. <laughs> like John said, we should know shortly um, if we are able to continue. Uh, but as we mentioned before, we are able to hold uh, up to 15 minutes and still be able to lift off today. Yeah, on Falcon 9, it's a little bit different. Once we start propellant loading, we pretty much have to go at the targeted time. Otherwise, the propellants can warm up and we may not have the performance for that particular uh, mission profile. It's a little bit different on and Starship. Folks, if I can interrupt, yeah. it looks like they're clearing all the flags and we're going to release at T minus 40 seconds. That is amazing news. Amazing. <laughs> Team working quickly through their issues on first and second stages. And I'm sure all of the rehearsals uh, and simulations that they've been doing have prepared them to evaluate this data quickly to try to get us in for today's launch attempt. 
For those of you just joining, we have a brief hold um, at the T-minus 40-second mark. Uh, the team is resolving one issue with the bleed purge on the Stage 2 Raptors. Um, like John just said, the teams are quickly working that, and it looks like the flags are being cleared as we speak. So we should be able to resume the launch countdown any moment now. And it's worth noting on Starship that once we resume the countdown, it restarts from the 40-second period, and then we keep exactly. going unless another condition pops up. So stick around, because <laughs> uh, Starship could be going here real soon. <laughs> Don't walk away, that's for sure. <laughs> Amazing views here coming to us from Starbase, Texas. Uh, Maximum aerodynamic pressure. And as the velocity increases, the density of the atmosphere is decreasing. Max Q. Lessening stress on the vehicle. The call out, Max Q now. Continuing to watch the first stage as we head down range. Hundred seconds into flight. Our next major activity is going to be set down of the first stage. The Houston tracking station now acquiring the vehicle. With shutdown, we will get separation of Starship from Super Heavy and ignition of the Starship engines. When Starship separates, we light up six engines in a staggered sequence. And if all goes well, those six engines will burn for almost six and a half minutes. Onboard view from Starship. And there's views of the Raptor engines on the second stage as we prepare for stage separation. Now after stage separation, the first stage will flip and begin a boost back maneuver for landing in the Gulf. Continuing to fly, two minutes, 40 seconds. Let's get ready for main engine cutoff. Beginning the flip for stage separation. As of right now, we are awaiting stage separation, where Starship should separate from the Super Heavy booster. 
Yeah, Kate, right now it looks like we saw the start of the flip, but obviously we're seeing from the ground cameras the entire Starship stack continuing to rotate. We should have had separation by now. Obviously, this is uh, does not appear to be a nominal situation. Yeah, it does appear to be spinning, but I do want to remind everyone that everything after clearing the tower was icing on the cake. Everyone here absolutely pumped to clear the pad and make it this far into the test flight. The first integrated flight of the booster and the Starship vehicle. Live view there of our control center at Starbase. Uh, which we refer to as Star Command. <laughs> as we've said before, obviously we wanted to make it all the way through, <laughs> but to get this far, honestly, is amazing. <laughs> well, if you're just joining us, Starship just experienced what we call a rapid unscheduled disassembly or a RUD during ascent. But now this was a development test. This is the first test flight of Starship, and the goal was to gather the data and as we said, clear the pad and get ready to go again. So you never know exactly what's gonna happen, but as we promised, excitement is guaranteed. And Starship gave us a rather spectacular end to what was truly an incredible test thus far. Now, as we mentioned at the start of today's program, any and all the data that we collected during the test is going to help us with further development of Starship, and it's going to improve the vehicle's reliability as SpaceX seeks to make life multiplanetary. It's really worth noting that the flight path was designed to be over water and all the air and sea space along with that flight path and those surrounding areas were cleared in advance of the test. And of course, we're going to be coordinating with local authorities for the recovery operations. But honestly, what an exciting morning. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we had a successful liftoff from Starbase, Texas at 8.28 a.m. Central Time. Uh, we cleared the tower, which honestly was our only hope. <laughs> we cleared the tower and all the data that we collected all the way through um, the, all those Raptor, those 33, although I think we saw that three Raptor engines were out. Um, but Yeah, well, quite a hard act to follow, but um, now that everyone's excited and inspired, uh, we can continue with the session. <laughs> so up next, we have uh, Jonathan Slavik from Astrobotic, and he's going to be talking about low energy use construction for the Moon and Mars. Thanks. Oh, dear. Well, thanks for, uh, for everyone who's sticking around. Uh, definitely a hard act to follow, but certainly a memorable one, and uh, hopefully makes the, uh, the topic that we're gonna be covering today, uh, or that I'm gonna be covering now, uh, a lot more relevant as we're talking about uh, additive construction of landing pads for the Moon and Mars, uh, very similar to the ones that Starship will be using in hopefully the near future. Um, yeah, so just as a quick introduction for those who may not be familiar, uh, I am a my name is John Slavik, and I'm a research engineer at uh, Astrobotic Technology. Astrobotic is an American company, and we really see ourselves as a space infrastructure company. So we're one of the uh, four contracted CLIPS providers uh, through NASA to provide robotic uh, payload delivery to the lunar surface. And we've actually got our first launch coming up here uh, at the beginning of May um, for our Peregrine lander, which will be touching down not too long after our friends at iSpace. Um, and it's actually also an initial, um, an initial launch on the, uh, the Vulcan rocket, so hopefully a little bit less exciting on takeoff there. Um, and then quickly following on from that, we'll be uh, we integrating and launching our Griffin lander, which is um, a large-scale uh, robotic lander that's going to be carrying payloads from, among others, our friends at ESA with the LandCam uh, X payload that uh, will be used for uh, precision landing validation and algorithm validation that hopefully will make it onto Argonaut over uh, on the other side of the room there eventually. 
Um, so as I say, we're an infrastructure company. That really means that we're transporting payloads to whatever location is scientifically inter interesting for our customers. So in addition to the pinpoint um, delivery to the lunar surface, we also specialize in rovers that we're able to use to move those payloads to areas where perhaps we can't land, and then provide infrastructure like power to those payloads once they're landed with our systems like LunaGrid, which is part of, uh, is, is our bid for the NASA VSAT uh, vertical solar array uh, system. Um, so that's what Astrobotic has been doing for a number of years, and very recently, as some of you may have heard, um, we acquired uh, Mastin Space Systems. And I actually am from the Mastin Space Systems group originally, uh, and we're, we're now calling ourselves the propulsion and testing arm of Astrobotic. And uh, what we really specialize in is vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Uh, so we've been doing that for an extremely long time, kind of with our initial first uh, win being the uh, Grumman Lunar X Prize Challenge, where we were able to demonstrate in 2009 uh, precision vertical landing capabilities. And we continue to do that as a uh, provider for a number of our partners in order to do uh, validation in a real world environment of particularly landing systems. For example, the Mars 2020 Perseverance um, precision landing system that was able to really put that rover down and, you know, with centimeter scale precision to uh, minimize the, the time to get to scientifically in, interesting locations, uh, we were able to validate that on our rockets and have that system actually control the rockets. So with all of this delivery and interesting stuff, what, uh, what I really do as a research engineer is develop some of the enabling technologies to allow us to go and do interesting things on the moon and sort of how we see our tech development suite and the technologies that we have are making sure that we are the first stepping stone to a lot of the technologies that we're talking about today, whether it's landing pads, whether it's habitats, whether it's survive the night, whether it's power generation. You know, we're talking about a lot of technologies that require huge down mass, huge infrastructure, and my focus and the focus of my team is to say, well, how can we, how can we kickstart that? How can we be the first step? So, what I really want to talk about today is our landing pad technology. And most of the people in this room are fairly familiar with the uh, necessity of lunar landing pads to prevent regolith and ejecta from um, destroying nearby landed assets or even in some cases with large enough payloads being launched back into lunar orbit and disrupting things like the lunar gateway. Um, so for that dust mitigation and that outpost building, we're going to need um, landing pads. So on the right here you can see some analysis that's been uh, done by one of our, uh, one of our friends over at uh, University of Central Florida, Phil Metzger, looking at uh, the energy requirements of some of the state of the art that people are talking about in terms of landing pad production. So microwave sintering, baking, you know, these things that ultimately are full ISRU. You just bring the technology to implement it and then you're able to use all material on site. That's fantastic but huge energy requirements, where are you gonna get that energy? And then if we go to a lower energy opportunity like polymer infusion, well that's not gonna put up with some of the really extreme environments that we might need for landing pads. So what do we do to get a landing pad in place before we have the infrastructure to put a landing pad in place? So the solution that uh, I proposed uh, with some other colleagues uh, a couple years ago now at Mastin Space Systems and have continued to de develop at Astrobotic is something that we're calling low additive, low energy additive construction. And it's very similar to what people are talking about with a lot of the polymer infusion uh, bricks, but it's what I would call an in situ derivable amorphous binder matrix mixed with regolith. So it's not a polymer, um, it's, it's a different binder agent. And uh, crucially for that binder agent, we're mixing it as an aqueous solution with the regolith, um, where we're actually adding water to the binder, we're creating the aqueous solution, and we're creating almost like a paste, uh, a very, very viscous, uh, relatively high regolith content paste that we are uh, using and then forming that into whatever we wanna make. And what's critical is the curing of the amorphous binder matrix is facilitated by the evaporation of the water and the water is not consumed in the process like terrestrial concrete. So 
when we cast or lay out or form whatever we're going to out of this material, uh, we're able to completely um, recollect the water and keep the water as a closed loop aspect of the system. So obviously everyone is, knows the value of lunar water and we don't want to just be throwing that away. So we've been able to develop a system where we're using water as one of the attributes but it's closed loop. Um, and because it's also a paste, we're able to make these uh, pavers and then we're able to grout between them as well to make larger and larger structures out of the same material. So you can see uh, kind of the, for some of the pavers that we use to test out the landing pad technology, we start with this square, that's probably 25, 30 centimeters, something like that, um, size. We've made the pavers and then we cut some of them in half and then grouted them back together with the same material. Um, there we go. So this is an image of a vacuum chamber that we were using to cure these materials. So we made a number of samples of these pavers that we want to try this material out as a prospective landing pad material. And we cured some of them in full vacuum, or as close to vacuum as you get, minus four, minus five tor, something like that. And some of them in a simulated Martian environment where we had one kPa of carbon dioxide to see how the different environments affect the formation of the landing pads. And as I noted previously, we cut some of them in half and grouted them back together. So that left us with a number of these samples. Uh, and we also, when, when I'm saying we, that's uh, Maston Space Systems and Astrobotic, now the same company, as well as a partnership with Pisces, which is a, uh, a research group out of the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, and this was all done under uh, NASA SBIR funding. So we created these, uh, these test pads and uh, with a significantly smaller methane uh, rocket engine than we just saw, uh, we're able to, uh, to test them and validate that this material after off-gassing was able to sustain a, uh, a landing rocket situation. So it's about a 450 Newton engine um, firing for two seconds at a very close uh, distance. And uh, in, the, in the animation you can see uh, you'll notice that there's large rocks around the, uh, the pad that's just kind of to keep everything in place for the testing, but underneath that landing pad, there's actually a large container of uh, regolith fines, that, um, regolith simulant fines. It's a medium, medium to high fidelity uh, regolith simulant that we're using, and that's to see what would happen if we did have burn through on any of these pads. And a, an interesting side note that I, I think is, is kind of interesting about this setup is that this is the exact setup, both um, the same engine and the same distance from the ground that we've proven in other testing causes what we call deep cratering underneath uh, the vehicle. So simulating what it's like if you were to land without a pad, in this exact configuration, we dig a 0 0.5 meter depth hole uh, underneath, the, uh, underneath the landing site, which is obviously not what you want, but it's, it's an interesting attribute we take advantage of in some other cases for uh, mining and excavation purposes. And we were actually able to dig a half meter deep hole through dry regolith overburden, through granulated uh, ice in regolith at 3% uh, by mass, as well as through cemented regolith. And it actually digs better through cemented regolith, uh, which is uh, an interesting side note. If, if anyone's interested in that, I have more details that I can, I can share offline. Um, but yeah, we were able to do this testing and fire directly on the pads. The, the non-animated image that you can see in the middle, you can see that we fired directly onto the grouted surface. So for the testing results, they were extremely positive. Uh, this, uh, this landing pad material was able to, able to put up with the, uh, the methalox engine firing directly onto it in firing onto the bulk material as well as onto the, the grouted paths or the grouted uh, channels that you can see right there. And those put up with things pretty well in either the lunar or the Martian curing uh, versions that we had. And uh, something that we also decided to work on and thought was really important is the refurbishment of these pads. So we, we talk a lot about landing pad material, sintered uh, landing pads, things like that, but if you need to land on it more than once, you have to be able to refurbish the pad after you've had some amount of damage from the rocket. That's something we see a lot on our vertical takeoff, vertical landing vehicles, where we're landing on a refractory concrete pad, 
uh, out in the desert, but we really have to change our landing location occasionally because we start chewing that material up. So our thought was, well, this is a paste material that we can use to grout between the pavers. What if we can use it to repair the pavers? So we, were, we did a little bit of surface prep to uh, ensure good bonding. Uh, some, of, some of the samples we didn't undercut, some of them we just did a surface preparation. Then we reapplied the uh, landing pad material and re-cured it in a vacuum or CO2 environment and fired on them again. Uh, so the results of the refurbishment were really compelling. Uh, the pads performed as well or better than the new pads after they had been repaired. And uh, you know, since we had them out there, we had the engine, we had the time, uh, we just kept firing at them. So uh, we did a secondary firing on one of the landing pads after not repairing it, and that pad did hold up. And uh, we had that pad with two fires on it, and we had a bunch of liquid nitrogen from another project sitting nearby. So we decided to soak that pad um, in liquid nitrogen for 10 minutes and then put it directly under the rocket engine and fire again. And uh, at that point, we did burn through the pad after a third firing, but we were really um, excited to see that there was no thermal shock in the pad. We didn't crack it, which we really kind of thought we would. So this spoke really well to the resiliency of this uh, amorphous matrix that we're using to bind the regolith. Um, and then after the fact, we really needed to know what was happening with the material. So we ended up cutting the pavers up into uh, to slices, both with areas that had been fired, areas that had experienced one uh, landing and areas that experienced multiple landings, and we did some uh, structural testing on them, specifically compressive and flexural testing. And the results were, were interesting in that uh, the material showed uh, lower material properties, weaker material properties than terrestrial concrete. Uh, however, when you normalize the, uh, the results that we see from terrestrial refractory concrete that's generally used in landing pads, when you normalize that to lunar gravity, um, they perform on par with, uh, with standard terrestrial landing pads. So it's not something we could use terrestrially as a building material that would hold up to the same structural loads that we would experience on Earth, but on the moon, we should have similar um, strength margins when we use this material as a construction material. Um, so really, it's, and it, it's an exciting kind of time to be working on this project, and we have a lot of kind of next steps and next things that we want to work on. Uh, with this material. We were awarded a, a NASA SBIR phase two, which is gonna kick off here fairly shortly. And the goal of that project is not actually to work anymore on the formulation of the binder. We're pretty happy with that. We want to create a um, deployment unit, which is ready for flight uh, validation, that we are able to extrude this material out in a number of shapes. So that may mean extruding it out into those pavers we were using. That may mean changing the extrusion head and using it as a grouting tool to connect multiple pavers. Or it may mean changing out the shape and extruding into some other shape that we haven't decided on yet, something like an I-beam for construction or a wall panel for a habitat or, or anything else. And kind of seeing where we can take this material and then also making sure that the unit we design for the implementation of this material is more material agnostic in that we can use it to validate other people's work relative to binder infusion for, um, or excuse me, polymer infusion for regolith binding. So we can try different materials. Maybe, maybe our initial results were great, but you know, once we get further down the testing, um, pipeline, we, we find that the performance is not as good as we had hoped, we'd be able to switch in a, uh, a formulation from someone at ESA or someone at NASA or, or someone else and validate it with the same hardware that we've designed. And hopefully that puts us in a really good position to bring this on one of our upcoming lunar missions and do validation of multiple landing pad materials. So if that's something that you're interested in, uh, certainly come and, uh, come and find me and we can talk about how, uh, how we can incorporate and work together on landing pads in the future. And uh, with that, I will uh, let everyone breathe and maybe take a break after that exciting uh, launch we got to watch, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jonathan, for that uh, really relevant and perfect follow-on presentation. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for, for live Q&A. Um, however, we've had online questions to essentially all of the speakers, I think. So please go on, answer them online. There's some really interesting questions on there. 
Um, and with that, we'll close this uh, session. So thanks again to all the speakers. Uh, and I'll pass over to Lisa. We've got one more talk really quickly coming up, so please don't go anywhere. Thank you. all of the talks as well. Uh, just before you go to the coffee break, we have uh, a very short talk from somebody you will all know. And if you don't know, you will know him by the end of tonight, Jim from Offworld. I uh, hope this microphone is on. Good. What's the most important space resource? Quickly, anyone? No. No. Close. Yes. You. The most important space resource is everyone in this room. Where we are today is at an existential pinch point in human history. We are the only generation that is at the interface between a planetary bound civilization and a galactic celestial species expanding into the cosmos. The opportunity is extraordinary, the responsibility is huge, and the risks are perilous. We are at that point in time where the potential of meeting the great filter for our civilization has never been as likely as ever before. The energies that we wield today as a species are beyond our ability to control them consistently. So this generation, you, are not just in the space industry or the space resources industry. You are actually the great filter engineers of our civilization. This is our moment. Everyone in this room, everyone watching, and our colleagues in the sector are the most important people for the journey of humanity into the cosmos. So with that, I look forward to welcoming you to the reception this evening at Piri Piri. I look forward to building civilization with you as we go out into the solar system, into the stars, and let us all go off-world. Thank you.